Okay, so uh, sorry for that. Uh, there was a technical problem. Uh, our uh, signal loss was lost. So anyway, let's uh, continue on. So I was uh, showing you this uh, slide earlier where you would see a panel board uh, installed very close to a gasoline dispensing unit. So this is a very clear violation of the code. And add to this is uh, uh, not only there's a panel board above it, but there's also this outlet that is installed just below the panel board, which is of course is also a violation of uh, the code. No? So uh, um, now you see that many of our countrymen are still uh, uh, lacking in uh, the basic uh, necessities for uh, a real uh, foolproof installation, uh, devoid of uh, unsafe uh, uh, installation or practices. So um, this was uh, installed elsewhere in Metro Manila uh, uh, some years ago. Okay, so uh, now we proceed. The, the spread of fire is, uh, can be caused by either a convection, by radiation, or by conduction. And when you say convection, that means that the fire uh, could uh, spread by uh, the direct uh, uh, expansion of the, of the fire. And by radiation means uh, it's passed through the, uh, through the air. And by conduction means that uh, fire could be transferred through material. So there's the importance, therefore, of a uh, of a firewall, no? so as not to uh, convey uh, heat to an adjoining uh, structure. Okay, so therefore this one would play a very important role in uh, the prevention of fire. The provision of a good compliant um, firewall. So here is a, a schematic uh, a credit to uh, the owner of this. No? Okay, so now we proceed to prevention, which is fire detection and alarm system. This is the fastest way to uh, alarm the people no? staying in a building. Uh, as I was telling, the sprinkler system can work to stop the spread of fire, but but it is the fire detection and alarm system that will uh, uh, work to save the people in a building. Okay? So, uh, uh, my belief, it is not the sprinkler that really can uh, protect the people. But it is the, the FDAS primarily that protects the people. Okay? So, why is the FDAS required? Of course, in order to pro to save lives, no, uh, to detect fire in areas, notify building occupants to take evasive action to escape the dangers of the hostile fire, uh, to summon organize assistance uh, to initiate or assist in fire control activities, initiate automatic fire control suppression systems, and to sound an alarm, and supervise the fire control and suppression system to assure operational status uh, in, and maintain initiate auxiliary functions involving environmental utility and process control so so uh, these are the functions of a fire detection and alarm system okay uh, here is a schematic showing us the fire detection and alarm system or fdas so the original fdas just simply include this this portion, no? so you have the smoke detectors, the heat detectors, and the manual pull stations. No? And you have a fire alarm control panel on FACP. It is a logic device uh, which receives the signal from the detectors. And this one, this FACP of fire alarm control panel or control device will send uh, instructions to your uh, audiovisual devices like sirens, hotters, buzzers, lights, and so on and so forth in order to create the noise for people inside the building to be able to act immediately and uh, avoid 
the possibility of being uh, suffocated or uh, you know could die no so these are the input devices on the uh, left side and in the middle is the control panel and in the right side is the output de devices now it is my proposal to make it more complete by providing this one this rectangle here which is I include here hydrogen sulfide H2S then CO is carbon monoxide then here is LPG gas and here is CH4 or uh, methane or CH4 no and these are gas sensors and detectors and they should input the, the uh, detection of these gases to your control panel or a specif special control panel so that they will actuate alarms also spatial alarms and uh, actuate or operate extraction funds of smoke and carbon monoxide as well as the pressurization funds of the escape road so they the stairwell and here in below is a smart watch uh, now with uh, if you're using a an addressable type a computer based fire alarm control panel it is possible to send signals to cell phones which can vibrate or watches smart watches that can vibrate so in other words uh, there is a dimension being added here the standard today is just two two alarms one is audio that means hearing and the second is visual as a matter of fact in a fire or in a person we have the five senses no so we have the sense of uh, hearing which the siren will work for it no and then the sense of uh, seeing so the a, uh, a rotating beacon or an LED bulb uh, will work for it of course if you are inside the burning room uh, you would be able to smell uh, the smoke the presence of fire so there are already three senses no sense of smell sense of seeing and, uh, and the sense of seeing no so there are still two remaining senses that god gave us that has not been put into the design of the fdas and that is what the sense of feeling and the sense of uh, tasting the sense of feeling can be can be used uh, for this smart watch or for smartphones that can operate to vibrate but but the problem with the smartphones is we do not hold it while we are asleep so it might be uh, not possible to really uh, wake up people with with this vibration so the the, the better way is to use uh, smart watches now smart watches that have sim cards and programmed to be actuated by a uh, programmable device okay so now with this system you have the sense of smell sense of hearing sense of sight sense of feeling only the sense of taste cannot be put to this because no way no no way could you uh, utilize this uh, as of today in a design okay so that's the idea of our life and safety uh, suge suggestion proposal to make it more complete okay now let's proceed criteria to determine the layout of fire detectors the design construction and operational features of all types of detectors shall be in accordance with re relevant standards the number of fire detectors to be installed is governed by the total area protected type of building construction the air movement and air velocity you know if there's uh, air conditioning of course no? and uh, ceiling obstructions uh, let's say for example you have uh, uh, multiple ceilings you know then of course concentration of equipment in area covered so if you have uh, very expensive equipment then there is a need therefore to provide for more intense detection in those very special rooms that contain this special equipment like electrical rooms like computer rooms like server rooms okay and then the sensitivity required area is divided into zones to be protected so say for example you have a big uh, building like uh, 
the, the mega mall, then that means that you'll be dividing it into several floors plus dividing it into several areas like dining areas, hallway areas, and so on and so forth. So in, in, in a big area, you'll find out that there will be so many zones. In an in a ordinary building, uh, if it is a four-story building, most possibly there will be four zones, one zone per floor. But in a wide building or a long building, chances are you'll be providing more zones. In a high-rise building, say if you have uh, uh, a 17-story uh, building, most possibly you will also have 17 zones. Uh, plus, of course, the roof deck, and maybe if there is a basement, you have to add some more zones into your system. So it will be easy for you to be able to determine uh, where the fire has started. Okay, areas above the false ceiling and below false flooring shall be considered at separate zones. Okay, under ideal conditions of smooth ceiling and average room size, one detector is recommended to protect the area. Then, ionization type detectors should be located where the largest combustible gas concentration can be expected. And say for example, it is also important to provide uh, fire gas detectors in this kind of location where you have combustible gases. In the air conditioned areas, both ionization and optical type smoke detectors are used. And detectors must always be, in, yeah, well, must be always installed at the highest point of the building, of the ceiling, and a minimum coverage indicated by, man, by manufacturer shall be considered. So like for example, if you have a, a building like the Araneta Coliseum, you will be providing detectors at the topmost point of the building, plus of course, underneath the bleachers where usually uh, there is also a trap for the air there. No? And then number of detectors and their location should be so selected that complete coverage is obtained. So uh, sometimes you have to uh, provide some duplication in the number of detectors. No? Um, although there is this uh, area provided, maximum area like this, no? for a general area application, one detector per um, 35 to 40 square meters area but that doesn't mean to say that uh, uh, you will only be limited to just one no? so because if a building is a very long i mean uh, if a room is quite long uh, long or narrow no so i'll give you an example the width is say four meters and the length is 10 meters then i would suggest you will be installing uh, two detectors uh, strategically located in the longitudinal room. Uh, so 4 by 10, very long. No? So if it is 3 meters wide by by uh, 13 meters something, so that's still about 40, then you need maybe one or two, two or three detectors. Okay. So uh, it depends, so, but this is only the minimum for a uh, a, a square or a semi-rectangular room of general application. Now this next line is 20 to 25 square meters for main control room, electronic cubicle room, like just like your what I was uh, mentioning, the uh, computer room, server rooms, etc. No, or electrical room. So, so s such kind of uh, a very important. E equipment installed you have to to provide more detectors into it and i would suggest you have to do some duplication in this kind of room because of the very uh, nature of the equipment installed in this kind of rooms okay and of course you have to comply with the requirements of the code now we have two types of the fdas one is the conventional type fdas and the uh, addressable type or computer based microprocessor based addressable uh, FDAS system okay so the conventional is more of a logic system so it's, uh, logic relay devices uh, assembled together to provide a a, a, a uh, an operation of logic when there is a, a smoke or heat detected and then the, the other one is uh, 
an addressable type meaning to say it is uh, it make use of uh, computers okay computers and uh, for the conventional type uh, you need fire sense conventional fire sensors are used and manual call points are being provided for continuous surveillance of the areas then main fire alarm panels uh, and derive signals from zone from the zone indicating the panels and audible and visual annunciation shall be provided in the event of fire repeater panel shall be located in security house and fire station to alert firefighting and security personnel and fire detectors shall be selected depending on the type of fire expected in the particular area okay so mukhang nawawala na naman yung signal then all fire alarm circuits are uh, uh, shall be modular design type and uh, eh, nawawala sorry sorry ano ba yan PLDT nawawala ka sorry 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 okay all fire alarm circuits shall be modular and tapos na tayo dyan. the system design shall be such that operation and resetting of alarms for one zone detector will not block availability of alarm for any other zone the alarm system resetting shall be by common push button and not by individual switches for different zones and detectors okay how about the addressable type the addressable type fire detection and alarm system is an automatic fire or FDAS that consists fire detectors and manual call points position in zones loop and throughout the entire building it's almost the same as the conventional except that this uh, addressable type make use of a different language no? if the conventional type make use of uh, wires or copper wires uh, the signal are electricity or electric current and elec electricity in the addressable type it make use of uh, uh, binary code or electronic code no zero or one or on or off so if you're familiar with the uh, binary the basic language of the computers uh, with this uh, the communication would be much faster you know like for example your fiber cable is uh, using such kind of uh, detection binary because uh, the speed of light is so fast no i think uh, 3 times 10 to the 6 um, 3 times 10 to the 6 uh, meters per second that's how fast the speed of light is so when you pass them through your fiber optic lines uh, the signal will be much faster as compared when you use copper wires or uh, cables where there is a problem of uh, voltage drop and the possibility of uh, the lines could be grounded uh, causing some statics also so uh, that's a problem with uh, copper no? so uh, uh, therefore binary or a computer language is much much better now this uh, addressable type is used in industrial and non-industrial buildings in institutional buildings of course in residential uh, buildings and apartments in hotels and hospitals uh, in all industries also in malls and multi-story complexes uh, multi-story buildings and in offices and control rooms okay here is a uh, schematic diagram for the addressable type where you have here the control panel and the various components like uh, uh, the sensors and uh, output devices and so on okay so uh, you have the addressable um, input devices and you have the addressable output devices control panel constant power supply and there is the emergency battery supply okay so uh, if you are in the addressable type you make sure that your components are 
uh, not the analog type but digital type okay so in other words your uh, analog type devices cannot be used in the addressable type system and uh, similarly your uh, analog uh, or your the digital cannot also be used in the analog in the digital in the analog device or vice versa okay so the microprocessor based control panel uh, uh, looks like this so you have a computer which uh, houses the, the processor or the CPU central processing unit then you have adequate number of loop modules or detector loops so Oh, yeah, there are the smoke detectors and the heat detectors and so on and so forth. And a colored video monitor with keyboard, of course. Output modules for alarm, output control and interlocks, and communication modules for interfacing. Okay. So the benefits of the addressable type includes continuous supervision of the detector connecting lines, individual detector performance, operation and disconnection, removal of detectors so uh, it the, the 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 wiring could be done electronically or connection could be done electronically discrimination between a real and real fire and a, a false fire conditions by incorporating signal verification and other features individual detector and addressing capability detection of over and under sensitive detectors and automatic calibration by increasing or decreasing their sensitivity levels based on environmental conditions like air movement, fumes, humidity. Pre-alarm in the case of any detector, detectors requiring maintenance. Facilities shall be provided for uh, alteration uh, program according to the needs. Then, uh, these are uh, the pictures of the manual pull stations. Huh? So, as you could see uh, on the, the pictures on the right side, uh, there is a, uh, a glass uh, on, on, on the front side, so it needs to be broken so that you can press on the bottom. So, this is an ordinary uh, switch station or pull station. We call it just pull station, but originally it is a switch station. And here is uh, uh, the fire detectors. Okay. Uh, we have the heat detectors here, heat detectors. So there are two types, the fixed temperature type and the rate of rise type. Then the smoke detectors, uh, the more popular is the photoelectric type. And number two is the ionization type. Then we have the flame detectors which make use of ultraviolet rays and infrared detection. And of course, the fire gas detectors. The fire gas detectors will be discussed later. So it will uh, determine uh, uh, the presence of uh, LPG gas, methane, hydrogen sulfide, or carbon monoxide. Okay? So, uh, Okay. Now the, this is the picture of a fixed temperature type heat detector. So detect heat one by one or more of three primary principles of physics by expansion of heated material, melting of uh, heated material, and changes in uh, resistance of uh, heated materials. Okay, so uh, the rate of rise heat detectors operate on a principle of that the temperature in a room will increase faster from fire than from atmospheric temperature. We uh, uh, will initiate an alarm. Uh, let me just go back to one. Nawawala. Very bad, no? Wait for a while. Okay, so uh, let's continue. 
Alarm can be initiated at temperature far below the required for a fixed temperature device. This reliable device not subject to false activations. But if not properly installed, they can be activate, activated under non-fire conditions. Example, detector located too closely to doorway and subject to extreme fluctuations of temperature. Uh, pneumatic rate of rice spot detector pneumatic rate of rice line detector and thermal electric detector okay, here is a, a, a picture of uh, or a sketch description of this rate of rice heat detector now the photoelectric uh, smoke detector looks like this uh, uses a photocell coupled with a specific light source Basically, smoke uh, entering the smoke detector chamber disrupts the light beam, causing an alarm signal to be initiated. More sensitive to smoldering fires. Okay. So here you have the components. Uh, we have here the picture. We have the optical chamber. We have the cover, the case molding, the photodiode detector, and the infrared LED. Here is the ionization type. Um, invisible products of combustion enter the chamber, decreasing the current between the negative V plus V plates, thereby initiating an alarm signal. Generally response faster to uh, flaming fires versus smoldering fires. Uh, automatically resets when the atmosphere clears. So here is a uh, a, a drawing or a sketch of uh, how it looks like okay. now we have the fire gas detectors fire gas detectors uh, monitors the level of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide which is which are both common in all fires no? more discriminating than other detectors can be designed to be sensitive only to gases produced by specific types of hostile fires and ignores gases produced by friendly fires. Not many in use, very specialized applications. So now, uh, because uh, this is not much in use, so we put emphasis in our explanation that it is very important to have this carbon monoxide detector. Why? Because uh, most of the uh, cause of death in in fires in enclosed building are caused by the presence of carbon monoxide. You know when uh, when you have an incomplete fire inside the building, just like the research world incident, uh, the gunman uh, 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 initiated fires which did not uh, really prosper to big fires, no. And uh, the small fires produced uh, carbon monoxide. And the carbon monoxide was scattered throughout the different rooms in the resource world. And therefore, this caused the intoxication uh, of the people who were founded on the next day of the incident. So, carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, tasteless, flammable, toxic, or poisonous gas uh, it is slightly lighter than air no? so it is produced during fires in enclosed areas due to incomplete combustion present in enclosed or practically enclosed parking levels of building or malls due to the smoke from park vehicles that are running so in other words uh, sometimes in the basement some vehicles are running there's a possibility that carbon monoxide are being produced okay so therefore the solution there is to install carbon monoxide uh, detectors here the carbon monoxide detectors which should sound an alarm and ad automatically run smoke ex smoke extraction or ventilating fans so that's the only way because why uh, you, you you cannot detect it no I mean a person cannot uh, do not know if uh, there is a carbon monoxide in there no because it is colorless it is odorless 
and tasteless and of course it is poisonous or toxic okay so that's the big problem with carbon monoxide it's colorless and odorless uh, you will never know that you already have inhaled some of this and you know that could kill a person now here is my explanation carbon monoxide the silent killer CO is often called the invisible silent slow killer carbon monoxide is an odorless or colorless gas created when fuel such as gasoline coal natural gas profane methane plastic wood paper burn incompletely in enclosed spaces like malls theaters offices hospitals hotels motels dorms and in homes smoke from fires or from cooking equipment that burn fuel are potentially sources of carbon monoxide vehicles or generators running in poorly ventilated semi and closed parking floors or garages may also produce dangerous levers of carbon monoxide the dangers of carbon monoxide exposure depend on the number of variables including one the victim's health and activity level infants pregnant women and people with physical conditions that limit their body's ability to use oxygen like if they have emphysema, asthma, heart disease can be more severely affected by lowering concentration or by lower concentrations of carbon monoxide than heavy adults or healthy adults would be okay a person can be poisoned by a small amount of carbon monoxide over a longer period of time or by a large amount of carbon monoxide over a shorter amount of time. So in other words, if a big amount of carbon monoxide is uh, is there in the place and you inhale it, then chances are you might uh, die very fast. If you have a small amount but uh, uh, you are being poisoned uh, for a longer time, then you may also succumb to this uh, toxic gas. So that's that's why they call this the silent killer and we should be very uh, wary about it provide our existing buildings today with this detector uh, our f dash for today doesn't include it yet i yours truly started to advocate the provision of carbon monoxide detectors in enclosed buildings uh, just a few months after the research world fire because I noticed that even the NFPA uh, is not strict in the provision it's not in stringent in the provision of carbon monoxide detectors in enclosed buildings we should provide this because this, this is the only way to save people that could get intoxicated with carbon monoxide in enclosed buildings if you have a building that is ventilated then you don't worry so much with carbon monoxide okay of course some people say that but carbon monoxide is also produced together with carbon dioxide yes it is true the moment you have uh, a fire inside the building you produce carbon dioxide and you also produce carbon monoxide when you see the carbon di dioxide it has a color the color of uh, could be white or brown depending on the gravity of the fire and it is also possible now that uh, there is now the carbon monoxide but the big problem is like we said not all people are healthy enough to run so fast to the escape to, to, to the escape route or to the exit doors not everyone so imagine if you have a theater a movie house and people are running are stampeding going out to the fire exit chances are some people will will be affected along the way some of them will be run over by some people and uh, if they are if these people are are uh, they f or, or if these people fell down chances are they will be exposed longer to the carbon monoxide and therefore might affect their capability or capacity to stand up again and run for safety so in this situation you must be able to activate the alarm and at the same time run the extraction fund this one we should be we should add extraction funds so that uh, 
uh, the moment carbon monoxide are detected, then these extraction fans will uh, operate to exhaust or extract the carbon monoxide that is produced inside a burning building, a burning room. Okay, the next uh, gas that we, dis we will now discuss is hydrogen sulfide. Why? Hydrogen sulfide is a gas that is produced from the septic. And why do we put emphasis on this? Well, because in our homes or in the buildings, we have uh, the septic tanks being provided for sanitation purposes in the plumbing system. And in, uh, as in the case of the Glorieta 2 explosion, the the sump the sump that was collected in the basement of the building uh, collected too much of this uh, hydrogen sulfide together of course with uh, methane no? uh, because uh, both methane and hydrogen sulfide are uh, produced together from uh, sewer gas uh, from sewer water from sewage from sewer so uh, similarly, H2S is present in natural gas. So therefore, in the homes, when the the pit trap, the, the trap seal, the water in the trap seal in the floor drain, or the trap seal in the pit trap in the in the lavatory, or in the kitchen sink, uh, is suddenly evaporated or is lost due to leakage, then the trap seal, the water. Uh, which should be the providing the trap of the toxic gases coming from the septic tank it's no longer there and therefore it will go to the room and the occupants will might be able to uh, inhale it and again this gas is colorless is corrosive it's flammable toxic and also poisonous okay of course uh, its characteristic is same with that with the LPG which is heavier than air all of these natural gases hydrogen sulfide LPG which also come from natural gas or from uh, crude oil and uh, methane which also come from natural uh, it's a natural gas are heavier than air so that means that these gases occupy a space closer to the floor as compared to the carbon monoxide which is lighter than air and occupies a space closer to the ceiling but because these are gases they could expand depending on the on the volume uh, depending on the volume so so with these heavier gases if plenty is produced it could also occupy the entire room like just like the case of the Gloriet, I uh, no, no the the Serendra explosion of 2013, the room in the sixth floor which exploded contained uh, LPG gas. I mean uh, the gas could have been from from the floor to the ceiling of that uh, room. So, so when it was ig ignited by a switching of uh, the the switch of the light of the room it exploded so it ignited the gas and exploded which shattered the walls of that six six floor unit okay so let, let's go back the only way therefore to detect or to protect us from this gas which is toxic gas also and flammable at the same time is also to have hydrogen sulfide gas detectors you know? and we should also sound an alarm specific alarm and run extraction uh, funds gas extraction funds or ventilation funds if especially if they are in the basement no? just like what happened in the in the Glorieta uh, they should have provided ventilating uh, extraction uh, funds there uh, usually you have to provide two of these funds one is a force draft fund a fresh a force draft and the extraction funds the one that will bring out the funds so induced draft uh, so a forced draft fund and an induced draft fund so that you inject fresh air from outside and you also bring out the 
toxic air outside. Okay, so that's the way to protect our buildings with this kind of gas. Okay, so by the way, I was always talking about sounding an alarm. I my suggestion is uh, not to simply use the present alarm of the F dash, no, which is the audiovisual. We have to provide. Uh, we have to use a programmable type system where you could uh, use a record sound. Like for example, uh, the moment a, a carbon monoxide or a toxic gas is detected, it so it could uh, sound like this. No warning. Uh, leave room immediately. Uh, toxic gas is present. Warning, leave room immediately. Uh, toxic gas is present. So, ganun dapat. We should have such kind of very specific instruction for occupants of the building so that they could be protected. Not just the usual uh, uh, audio visual buzzer, you know, uh, bell, hotels, etc. In addition to those, there should be this kind of audio alarms, so, uh, pre-recorded audio alarms, warning the people of the presence of these toxic gases, so that they would know very well where they could live, because the gas could be there in the basement, or the, there could be the presence of gas in the basement, or in the kitchen, if it is in a PG room, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now, the third, the third gas, of course, is LPG. Uh, I have mentioned already the Serendra explosion. You know, LPG is also heavier than air. So, um, we have to be very careful in the kitchen. The location of the LPG tanks must be outside of uh, the kitchen or outside of the building. Especially in big, uh, uh, if there are big storage, like, like in restaurants, they should be outside. If there are some uh, other installation, they should be provided in well-ventilated areas. And uh, care should be observed not to have uh, uh, canals or uh, manholes or what near these tanks. Otherwise, if there is a leak of this gas, this gas might occupy these canals or drains or or manholes because of the nature of the gas which is heavier than that air similarly with the hydrogen sulfide no they would occupy a uh, low uh, or or uh, manholes or low or uh, uh, in other words uh, areas that uh, that that tend to you know contain this uh, these gases uh, while if they are installed outside in a well ventilated area uh, the wind could just blow any leak gas and uh, lessening its uh, concentration and therefore lessening its uh, its uh, potential uh, to explode okay so again similar with this those er earlier gases we should have a gas detector to detect it and in the case of lpg we should have a an LPG shot of gas, solenoid valve. Uh, after detecting, automatically you this solenoid valve will be automatically will automatically operate to shut off the flow of gas to the burners or to the kitchen or what not to in order to reduce the the chances. Okay, so that's how. Uh, we need to protect our system okay now okay let me again restart oh, okay so bad huh? because uh, the the signal is uh, so weak nawawala so bad now let's continue the the fourth of this gas is the methane gas Methane gas is CH4 is mainly natural, it's also colorless, odorless, highly flammable gas, highly explosive. The good thing is it is not toxic. Uh, methane is not toxic. But the problem is methane is always 
uh, produced together with hydrogen sulfide. So the moment you uh, smell something bad, so that's the hydrogen sulfide, then there's the presence of methane, which is highly flammable. So therefore, uh, the only way, the best way to protect us is to have a methane gas detector okay, installed. And it should also sound that alarm that I was talking about, a, a, a pre-recorded uh, audio, uh, warning, uh, warning uh, audio, and should automatically run extraction or ventilating fan, similar to what I discussed in the in the hydrogen sulfide gas. Okay, so uh, so now the, here is the system that I'm uh, talking about. Uh, okay, you will now have your toxic gas detectors, carbon monoxide, as well as. Uh, um, methane gas, LPG gas, and hydrogen sulfide gas detectors inputted to your uh, programmable logic uh, uh, operated uh, fire detection and alarm system uh, FACP and actuate your toxic gas extraction funds that should be the best way to protect people who are in or inside uh, buildings okay so uh, let me go back nawala nawala na naman yata so bad oh my god uh -huh. anyway mabuti na lang at uh, I'm, anyway don't you worry I'm recording it so uh, because uh, our uh, wifi signal is uh Putol putol, uh, we can also up upload our recorded uh, uh, recorded uh, video of this later. Okay, so we'll, we'll just continue anyway. Uh, just bear with us. Okay, here is a next slide showing us uh, a very simple way of providing uh, or or uh, protecting your room, so assuming that you are living in a condominium and uh, you have an exhaust fan in there uh, if you have an exhaust fan in your bathroom or in your toilet and you may want to include a, uh, a carbon monoxide gas detector so that you could be protected no so your carbon monoxide gas detector could be insta installed in your ceiling uh, at the top of your bed or uh, just uh, at the top of your bed okay where you are sleeping, where you stay, and the moment it detects the presence of carbon monoxide, it will automatically actuate your exhaust fan in your bedroom. Of course, uh, the smoke will also produce uh, or actuate the fire alarm control panel. But at least, if you have not, if you are you have ta uh, some delay in leaving your room comparing for safety at least at the time your exhaust fan in your bathroom is already functioning to uh, extract the carbon monoxide in the ceiling of the your room so this is a way to connect it to your uh, connecting the carbon um, the carbon monoxide gas detector in parallel with your switch automatically run your toxic gas extraction fan okay now F does combination sensors. There are uh, combination sensors, meaning uh, uh, just a, s a single sensor which includes already uh, fo photo, photo uh, electric, uh, and also could also detect heat. So, of course, these kind of detectors are much more expensive than the single detectors. Okay, and here I have two slides. that would recommend the type of uh, detection in different application in the industrial sectors no so you would see here in co electrical control rooms you would have this uh, type of detectors ionization and optical type in switch gear rooms ionization type 
And of course, you also need heat detectors, of course. In office rooms and storage, ionization type. In battery rooms, uh, cor must be corrosion resistant if they are using the, the lead acid, uh, not maintenance free. Uh, rate of rise temperature type. In cable gallery, meaning to say in uh, uh, where you run your cables or feeders, combination of optical type and smoke detectors and linear heat detectors. In station buildings or plant area, then use infrared flame detectors. Where oil tanks are located, spray tanks, rate of rise temperature, uh, detector with fixed element. In coal conveyors, assuming, so that means uh, coal is a flammable substance, analog linear heat detectors, uh, infrared spark, ember detectors, and manual coal points. If water spray system is provided, uh, we'll cross zone to actuate the, the same. Okay? Dusty areas in coal handling plants like crusher house. Flame proof manual coal points. Junction towers, flame proof heat detectors. Conveyor tunnels, flame proof spread detectors. Hazardous plant areas such as fuel oil, lob oil, diesel generator houses, hydrogen generating plants, hydrogen storage areas, flame proof rate of rise temperature detector with fixed element and flame proof MCP. So those are the suggestions. Now these are the, aud the audible output devices and audible alarm signal lets people know the alarm system has been activated. Devices may be mounted inside or outside based on the level of protection required. This include the sirens, bells, buzzers, horns, voice drivers, hooters, so uh, they could look like this, no? Bells and uh, sirens and, uh, and horns, okay? Okay, for the output put devices that are this well so these are the rotating beacons uh, LED valves and uh, blinking lights and so on so strobe lights LED and on off printer the printer could also be used to print the output okay and I have included here the the smart watch system a smart watch is fairly new um, today there are now the smart watch which you can uh, which is uh, provided with a SIM card and the SIM card has a number that is programmed to be sent with a signal in case your pro uh, programmable type or addressable type FACP will will uh, will actuate okay so to comply with this uh, uh, to comply with the code we have here the fire code of the Philippines and uh, its late, uh, latest implementing rule, the Philippine Electrical Code Part 1, the Philippine Electronics Code, code Book 2, that's F dash, then NFPA 72, National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code of the USA, then the Underwriters Laboratories or UL, any other internationally recognized body acceptable to the purchaser or consultant of your project and here are just the diagrams uh, I mean the symbols that should be included in diagrams FACP fire alarm control panel RAP remote annunciator panel SD smoke detector flame detector and so on and so forth and here is just a uh, schematic uh, diagram showing the layout of uh, smoke detectors or heat detectors so here we have the the heat, the smoke detectors here in each room one heat smoke detector provided here there and of course you have the fire alarm control panel there in the main corridor which should uh, do the should the actuate and produce the audio visual and and other alarms required and in open areas, although earlier we have uh, the up to te the 35 to 40 square meters area per detector for general purpose, and the 20, 20 to 25 square meters area for uh, important rooms. Uh, in case you have areas with which are in open, no open 
open areas but inside the building so meaning to say they are not totally enclosed uh, there is an open ventilation you have to provide uh, uh, at uh, three meters apart your detectors okay for fast detection and you can install the uh, detectors in a schematic diagrams like this one you have a, a two-story one a ground floor and a second floor so these circles here are the smoke detectors so on the ground floor and on the second floor they are interconnected to the fire alarm control panel here okay and of course your fire alarm control panel is usually connected to your power supply okay must be permanently connected okay and must be must also have a backup battery so it will provide the power uh, for a higher for taller buildings they will be shown like this in the riser uh, here is your ground floor maybe this is your mezzanine floor and this is your second floor third floor man, you can replicate it up to the deck roof of your building okay so uh, there is the uh, uh, fire alarm box here fire alarm box in each floor where you will where the interconnection of the wirings are being uh, pulled through uh, through a riser some schematics here for uh, a simple three story and for uh, a uh, for another system like uh, a programmable type and here you have uh, various brands all over the world you can uh, uh, you can always find a, a popular brand you know uh, you have Palmer you have uh, Honeywell you have uh, uh, what else Eton, you have uh, Cooper, and so on and so forth. So many of them worldwide. No? So now uh, let's proceed to the air pressurization portion of this presentation. But let's have a, a, a two to three minutes break.
Okay, okay. So let's uh, continue. Okay, let's continue. I'm just checking in my monitor. Okay, let's continue. Really problem with the... Okay. So, sterile pressurization, this is uh, NFPA 92. If F does is NFPA 72, NFPA 92 is uh, sterile pressurization. And if uh, sprinkler system is NFPA 13, and uh, of course, uh, there are some, uh, so many provisions in the NFPA, you know. So, uh, sterile pressurization is by the provision of uh, a, a force draft fan installed at the top of your uh, stairwell, no? just like this one. No? No, this, the, this is a top of the building, of the stairwell of the building. So, you would see this big fan being provided to automatically actuate in the event of a fire will suck fresh air from outside and bring it inside the top of the of the stairwell so uh, and here is a schematic for this uh, you you that that uh, fan there on top of the building uh, automatically running being actuated by the detection of the smoke when uh, smoke is de detected by uh, any of those uh, smoke detectors and the fire alarm control panel already has started to alarm it will also send a signal to automatically run your uh, pressurization fan okay and it will start to inject fresh air inside the stairwell the idea is to bring the pressure of the stairwell from the ambient uh, from the normal uh, atmospheric pressure of 14.7 PSI to uh, a higher pressure of uh, plus 3 to 5 PSI higher than the ambient pressure. The idea is if the pressure of this stairwell will become a little higher than inside the burning room, then it will, uh, it will prevent the entry of the smoke to the stairwell as the people are, are are uh, escaping from the burning room going to the stairwell and going out of the building no? uh, this pressurization fan will do the, the this function of uh, bringing the pressure okay so therefore uh, uh, chances for the people escaping from the burning rooms will be better of not inhaling the toxic gases okay so the big big problem really is if somebody is left behind inside the room 
still not uh, has not wake up or has not been or is, not, or is unconscious then that's uh, that's the problem these uh, people lef left behind will be might die no so that's why we suggested the provision of uh, extraction funds for for carbon monoxide and of course it's smoke although if you cannot come out eventually if the fire becomes very big then that might and the fire becomes uh, uh, will kill the person okay so today uh, we now use the variable frequency drive uh, control for this fund uh, in the old designs they simply use uh, across the line or Y delta starter and the, the problem then was how you could uh, control the speed of the fun because if if you just allow it to run and run and run the pressure might be too high and it might be difficult for people escaping to to push the panic uh, the panic bar of the uh, fire escape doors no? So, uh, the idea is to limit the pressure to just 3 to 5 PSI above the ambient pressure, okay? In the olden in the, before the advent of the variable frequency drive control, which is an electrical control, we use the relief lower. No? The relief lower is provided there to, uh, but this one is calibrated uh, or uh, yeah, calibrated for it to be uh, so that it will allow the opening of the lovers to allow the ex escape of uh, air if the pressure becomes too high. So, but this one is very difficult to calibrate. It's very difficult to calibrate, while a variable frequency drive control is much much easier in conjunction with a pressure uh, controller a pressure sensor controller which could be mounted uh, on each uh, floor no? so the the sensing of this control will now operate the uh, if the controller needs to allow a higher speed or a lower speed for this variable frequency drive driven uh, air pressurization fan okay so now here the textbook say there are several ways of providing it one is like this one it is being provided on top uh, on this portion no it's a centrifugal fan here now the big problem with this is that the provision of this ducting will tend to uh, uh, occupy space and therefore also um uh, also pro uh, no, uh, create friction in the flow of air no in the provision of uh, the air so uh, the, I the you know the idea of the centrifugal fan is just simply to add pressure okay As usually we do ducting when we are providing for uh comfort ventilation or comfort no? But uh, just for the purpose of pressurizing the stairwell, uh, the best way really is just to simply inject it at the top of the stairwell. No? Okay, this kind where your centrifugal pan is mounted on the ground is similar. No? You will need a space for the ducting like this. And again, the ducts will tend to uh, create friction in the flow of the, of the air or the pressurization fund. Of course, this kind of provision will uh, allow for easier maintenance because it is on the ground floor. But it would occupy space also. So, you know, um, not many architects would not like this kind of provision. This third arrangement would be much uh, be practical, you know, providing it at different levels. Say, for example, if you have a very tall building, say 30 story you might uh, as well subdivide uh, the may uh, from ground ground floor to the 10th you would need one and then from the 11 to the 20th another one and from the 21st to the 30th floor you maybe you need another one maybe th that could this could be a scheme that can be used but you need to provide for space for this 
uh, in the design of the stairwell. Otherwise, you just have to provide it on the top, just like this one, just provide it on the top, and provide sensors on its floor, measuring the pressure, and any one of these that could detect a uh, very low pressure will allow the operation of the variable frequency drive at a higher speed and the moment you reach a high pressure it will reduce so that's the only way to really equalize the pressure inside but not only for a short period of time while people are, are running for their safety it's just a few minutes okay after that it, it will be done no? so not like in in the air conditioning system where you have need to provide ducting because it's a comfort for 24 hours operation this this one is only for a short short period of time so that therefore I wouldn't believe that the provision of ducts is good because these ducts will just pay uh, will just uh, add up to the friction air friction flow as well as additional space okay uh, like I said the uh, Pressurization fans could be well be operated by variable uh, frequency drive, okay? And I just tried to find some standards in America. Uh, like in Canada, they have uh, standard velocities of 4.72 cubic meters per second plus this and that, this and that. No? And in the U.S., NFPA 92 and 1988 also mentioned uh, for 45 pascal minimum to 133 pascal minimum pressure so these were those times when the variable frequency drive was not yet provided so with the advent of the variable frequency drive control then this kind of very wide range of pressure can already be uh, made uh, much more uh, controllable to a pressure that is good just good for the people to be able to really even the weak people to push for the panic but panic bar in order to escape the building okay here is how the ashray would uh, calculate this uh, the capacity of the air pressurization fan okay so they would be considering the the doors and the walls and so on and so forth the openings to come up with the capacity okay and in one example, uh, we were able to compute 24,278 cubic feet per minute minimum. Uh, the typical fan would be driven by a 10 horsepower to 15 horsepower motor. So I would say 15 horsepower, variable frequency drive control. Of course, uh, 230 volts, 3 phase, 6 hertz, 29,000 cubic feet per minute. So very high, no? And the pressure switch set to 3 to 5 PSI above the internal pressure of the inner and closed areas. Okay, so that's the NFA 92. Very important as a provision of the of fire protection. Now we go to smoke extraction. Smoke extraction has, uh, has been already provided in most designs. No? As you could see here, I, I just took some uh, schematic from a project in Hong Kong and in Singapore. In other words, the, the British standards no, also provide for this. But take note that the fresh air would come from this duct and the basement of the building and would go inside certain lovers in its floor. These lovers, these lo lovers, and so on. And would, uh, th they would have exhaust here on the other side of the building where you have a uh, uh, a vertical stack and with an exact extraction fan at the top to be able to bring out this smoke okay the big problem here is that the exhaust fans the exposed exhaust lower are not maximized to be installed nearest to the maximum point of exit remember that the carbon monoxide could stay in this level so uh, 
uh, it must be installed at the top nearest to the edge of the ceiling okay here is another example where the uh, fresh air would come from the top of the building and would be uh, would enter the building here and would uh, uh, get inside now you would notice here there are some uh, control lovers so where the burning room is located the lover automatically opens to allow the movement of the air to be ex to be extracted and uh, here exhausted by this fan installed at the top of the of the chimney or the of the stack here no? okay ventilation st uh, ventilation stack okay so uh, i was able to see this uh, system design uh, for an atrium american design no? so you would see here supply uh, funds here supply funds on the left side and you would see uh, exhaust fans here at the top of the atrium oh, so see smoke exhaust fan so take note that the standards in america as well as in the in great in uh, british con controlled or in the ie standards countries uh, do not mention anything about toxic gases or carbon monoxide they just simply say smoke exhaust also, same, same here. They simply simply show smoke exhaust, but they do not mention of carbon monoxide here. Same here. Uh, they mention of smoke, 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 uh, but they do not mention of carbon monoxide. So, in other words, the world at that point in time before the research world was only giving, uh, aiming at to bring out the smoke, but not to. Uh, bring out the carbon monoxide so in this high rise again it mentions it shows uh, smoke extraction see uh, so of course in the in the stairwell it's not shown also no nothing is shown to provide the air pressurization but inside the the basement here you would see smoke extraction on both ends of the of the parking areas so say here you have a burning uh, car here then you have to exhaust the smoke and the carbon monoxide so in here okay in the parking you need to provide a uh, force drop fan here on the left side these two fans are force drop and on the other side is induced drop fans coupled with carbon monoxide detector installed so you have to ins install strategically carbon monoxide detector and it should automatically actuate this uh, induced draft and forced draft fans okay normally maybe you could use the forced draft fan and then in the presence of uh, carbon monoxide you could run the exhaust fan whichever you know, as long as you have a smoke or carbon monoxide detector and the presence of these uh, exhaust fans oh, I just like to point out uh, something about the Kentex fire this is a picture of the Kentex factory building which caught fire in 2015 you would notice that uh, the Kentex factory fire, the roofing, did not did not have any uh, ventilators. Uh, see, look at this building at the back. It has a ventilator. This blue building on the right side has a ventilator also, and this several warehouse here on the right side, far right side, the green ones. They also have ventilators, but but this building on the left side, this gray building, also do not have a ventilator, and so with this Kentex building. So my point is, had the Kentex 
building been provided with a, ventil uh, uh, a ventilator like this one okay or this one this this green building or this blue building or this red colored roof building maybe chances are there would be less intoxication of toxic gas like carbon monoxide and there would be less people that would have died uh, with about over a hundred employees uh, in a short period of time that the fire broke up uh, the, the, the people who died or succumbed to suffocation uh, numbered 72 meaning to say therefore uh, it is therefore uh, important for architects and builders of warehouses and owners to consider the provision of ventilators in their roofs so like this blue building like this green building here and like this red buildings uh, uh, this must be also be considered in the in the revision of the national building code of the philippines to uh, provide for these ventilators if people are working inside this kind of building so if just a simple warehouse maybe there is no need for these ventilators but if it is a factory building where people are working and then therefore uh, there is a chance that uh, when there is fire carbon monoxide could be produced so this should be a better scheme this uh, red this blue and this green building okay oh it's another picture of uh, two pictures of the kentex fire so factories should be provided with this exhaust ventilator so in case fire uh, these uh, ventilators can bring out of course the problem with this is that uh, by by the move by the operation of these uh, exhaust fans it, it will uh, bring in fresh air but of course at that point in time you have, you have sprinklers provided hydraulic uh, system provided the sprinklers would then put up the fire because as the fire becomes bigger the the sprinkler nozzles will get heated and sprinkler fire water okay so uh, that's the idea of uh, the exhaust fan at least it would bring out the toxic gases especially carbon monoxide okay so that is NFA 92 we now go to fire suppression systems uh, the the NFPA National Fire Protection Association is uh, was organized in 1986, so it is a non-profit organization established in 1896. So take note, huh? 1896, 1896, our forefathers were were still fighting for independence. Uh, remember the August 23, 1896, when uh, God Andres Bonifacio uh, led the tearing of cedula. So at that time america was already leading the world with the nfpa uh, organized no? far ahead than uh, great britain and europe factory manual was established in 1835 it is an organization of insurance companies and composed of mutual property casualty insurance company their objective is to provide insurance safety services uh, large manufacturing company institutions commercial and large housing buildings or projects okay let me just go back to NFA I did not finish mentioning it reduce the world burden of fire and other hazards and the quality of life by providing and advocating consensus codes and standards research training and organization okay how about UL? Underwriter Laboratory is a non-profit organization founded in 1894. So it was ahead by two years from the NFPA. In the US, and a safety testing and certification organization which permits the use of its lift listing mark or logo as its stamps mark of approval of goods and materials after standardized stringent testing. So. UL is uh, a, a, uh, a 
non-profit organization that can do the testing of this uh, equipment to ensure uh, higher quality of these devices. Okay. And here, uh, these are the um, different standards could be uh, that are used in the design. No? Every architect and fire protection designer shall comply and conform with the following codes and standards. Of course, the main code is the Fire Code of the Philippines, Republic Act uh, 9514, uh, enacted in uh, 2008. And of course, the reference codes are the National Building Code, the Philippine Society of Mechanical Engineers Code, the Uniform Mechanical Code, NFPA 1, Fire Prevention Code, Philippine Electrical Code, and the National Electrical Code, and of course, standards, the NFPA, Factory Manual, UL Standards, American Waterworks, and so on and so on and so forth. So, those are the various standards. Then, uh, There are two approaches to fire protection. Okay. The protection of a building and its components from damages by fire can be divided into two categories. No? The first category is uh, passive fire protection and the second category is the active fire protection. Okay. Up, the passive fire protection is uh, mainly the domain of the designer, the architect architect and the builder and here it is the selection of materials to be used for the building like for example the use of fire rated walls or floors or ceiling or roofs no? like for example uh, concrete hollow block walls or gypsum board or fiber cement board like hardy flex or uh, other uh, made of fire retardant materials in lieu of plywood, in lieu of uh, lawanit, and any other materials that can easily catch fire. So for fire and smoke control doors, the use of fire and smoke stopping seals or collars or pillars or blankets, uh, and uh, fire rated protect protective coatings or concrete encasement for, for steel columns and, uh, and, so, uh, and so on. No? And the use of fire and smoke damper curtains. No? The use of fire rated glass. You know, glass is manufactured from silica or sand, so it is fire rated, no? just like concrete. The use of fire rated leaf landing doors. And the use of fire rated ducting. Okay, so that's the way uh, to possibly. Uh, protect a, a building as to select or specify uh, fire retardant or, or materials that tend to slow down the spread of fire. Now how about the active fire protection? No? Okay. Oh, by the way, this is, this, it is a schematic or uh, a graphic showing the different materials like your floors, your walls, and ceilings and other materials inside your building where you can use or the architect can spe or the builder can specify uh, or, uh, fire retardant materials okay the important aspects of fire okay. so recommended building materials for passive fire pro are reinforced concrete concrete hollow blocks walls floors Gypsum board, perlite walls, fiber cement board, hardiplex panels, granite or mar marble panel walls or, or, or uh, yeah, finishes, ceramic tiles, red bricks, adobe blocks, thick glass panels, asbestos cement panels. So these are uh, fire fireproof materials or fire retardant or non-fire materials no? and the materials that are not recommended 
are the following plywood panels for walls, plyboard and uh, particle boards, lawanit panels, thin metal sheets, plastic sheet metals, carton sheets, and so on. It's like materials which can easily catch fire are not recommended. Of course, uh, you may say, how about those uh, squatters areas? The housing in the squatters areas. Well, maybe if you could include in the bill in the in the law that it would be uh, not allowable to construct or build a, um, uh, a squatters area or a, a temporary building area using dislike materials instead they should use at least like the hardy flex well, you know the price of the hardy flex sheets one fourth or the 316 is the same as the cost of the plywood so so therefore instead of using the plywood why not use the fire retardant hardy flex okay then we have the sprinkler system the sprinkler system is the most widely used apparatus for fire protection in buildings uh, it is it can be made automatic and the fire code of the Philippines requires an approved and supervised suppression system conforming to NFPA 13 for building 15 meters high from ground floor to the topmost floor. But of course today, if a building make use of uh, or of have people sleeping, just like hotel, motel, dormitory, and hospital, then it is already mandatory even if the building is less than 15 meters. Okay, fire suppression systems such as water sprinkler system consists of a network of piping installed at the ceiling or roof and supplied with water by means of an approved fire pump from suitable source. Okay, so this is what I was t telling earlier, uh, uh, earlier. The RA 9514 of 2008 mentions about the need to provide uh, sprinkler system for buildings even less than 15 stories high no? as long as they are hotel, motel, dormitory or hospital or if the building stores flammable, flammable materials so in other words even if you are less than 15 meters if you have this business hotel, motel, dormitory or uh, hospital meaning people uh, Guest, guests or people are sleeping inside no? then you must provide this otherwise if, uh, if if your building is not covered by these requirements uh, then you have to provide a uh, fire hose cabinets in its floor uh, to so that you can you can have the, the usual uh, uh, the use of this fire hose cabinets no? and of course you must have a Siamese twin and the the piping system also fire extinguishers adequately provided in its floor in its location okay okay so now we we'll discuss about ordinary combustible fire we have uh, class A fire fires in uh, in paper cloth wood rubber and many plastics require water type Extinguisher level A, and of course, class B, flammable liquids, fires in oils, gasoline, some paints, lacquers, grease, solvents, and other flammable liquids require an extinguisher lab uh, label B. And letter class C fire, electrical equipment, fires in wiring, fuse box, energized electrical equipment, computers, and other electrical sources require extinguisher label C okay fires for of, ex, of fire extinguishing media solid dry materials for type A fire so sand is uh, number one and number two liquid or wet materials for type A fires water is the cheapest and three gases for type B and C fires uh, 
uh, nitrogen gas, 80% in air. And of course, you have argonite gas, and you have uh, carbon dioxide gas. Okay. In classifiers, in electrical panels or switch gears, electrical tracing or fire tracing is uh, usually uh, a good option uh, where you have uh, an agent provided and the, the piping to the different parts of your electrical panels. Okay, and there is the FM200 type of for classifiers. FM200 is uh, uh, an agent-based uh, uh, suppression system. And here is a uh, schematic of this where you have the agent cylinders here and you have the control panel, you have the dis discharge piping, discharge nozzles and of course you have the detectors. The detectors will input it to the control panel and the, the agent will come out of the nozzles to put up the fire. Okay. Uh, of course uh, not only FM200, there are other uh, competitors of this, just like, uh, what's the name of that? Inergen, and there's another one, I forgot. No? So, in the kitchen, the class B fires, you can also add this type of system, where you have uh, the agent. And here is a uh, schematic of, uh, of a system that is being provided by this uh, uh, agent type suppression system and here similarly a, uh, a kitchen being provided or facility being provided with this uh, suppression system ok now we go to the automatic fire sprinkler systems so the automatic fire sprinkler system provides for uh, this the piping, the nozzles, uh, the spray nozzles, uh, different floors. You have the riser pipe that brings in the water from from below, and you have, uh, of course, the test test uh, valves, and here you have uh, the fire pumps. In this drawing, you have two fire pumps, and the middle pump is the jockey pump. The jockey pump is the one running continuously to pressurize the entire system. And then here you have two or a fire water tank divided into two. Okay, so uh, you can clean one part at a time if you need to clean. Okay, what is missing here are two components. One is the Siamese twin and the fire hose cabinet in its floor. So here in the succeeding draw diagram, I included the uh, fire hose cabinet here, this orange uh, thing, and here the fire department connection. So uh, the fire department connection is, was cut, no? so medyo gumalaw yung image. Okay? So that's how it is. Then components of the system include the stop valve. The stop valve is used to isolate the water supply. It may also be called the isolating valve. It is often painted red in color with a large bl black circular handle and is locked in the open position allowing the free flow of water from the supply. The stop valve is used to isolate the water supply coming from the fire sprinkler system. Often, the stop valve is also fitted with a valve monitoring device or valve monitor. Valve monitor that is used to monitor the state, open or closed condition of the stop valve. The water within the automatic fire sprinkler system can be divided into two parts. Okay. Uh, water supply main, a uh, water supply or mains. Okay. And then we have the alarm valve. Alarm bulb, also known as the alarm check bulb, is used 
to control the flow of water into the fire sprinkler system. This is accomplished by providing one-way check valve that is close to the water pressure of the fire sprinkler side. Okay. Then we have the automatic fire sprinkler, so it's used to control the flow of water. Okay. Then we have the alarm test bulb. Alarm test bulb is a small bulb, normally secured in the closed position. Uh, the alarm test bulb is fitted between the sprinkler system side of the alarm bulb and the drain. Then the motorized alarm bell or gong. The motorized alarm bell or gong is a mechanical device operated by the flow of water oscillating a hammer that strikes the gong, causing an audible alarm. Ancillary components of the system, in addition to those earlier, we have the flow switch. The flow switch is an electromechanical device that monitors the flow of water through the section of the pipe within an at automatic sprinkler system. Flow switches are often fitted with a mechanical delay of up to uh, 6 minutes preventing small or minor water flow fluctuations from signaling an alarm. Okay. Jacking pump or the jacking pump. It is a manual hand pump, electric or semi-automatic or fully automatic pump which are not always fitted to an automatic sprinkler system. They however provide a method of pumping boosting water from the water supply to the sprinkler system after the alarm device. This this leads to an increase in water pressure in the fire sprinkler system, thus forcing the alarm bulb into the closed position. Jacking pumps have a secondary function of maintaining the water pressure within the fire sprinkler system, reducing the likelihood of false alarms caused by low pressure caused by small water leaks. Number nine, pressure gauge. A pressure gauge is a measuring device that is usually fitted to an automatic sprinkler system. There are usually two gauges fitted in the system. One showing the water supply pressure and the second showing the installation pressure. Uh, here is a, a picture of a fire sprinkler control valve assembly with two risers. So there are two risers. Okay. And these are pictures of uh, the fire department connection, the Siamese team. Okay, so uh, you will notice that on the right side lower, you will see two pairs of Siamese twins. So in this uh, building, usually it has two uh, hydraulic lines, risers. No? This usually have single, single. No? In here, you have two risers. Okay? So depending on the size of the building, the height of the building, very tall buildings could have uh, uh, two Siamese twin, could have three Siamese twin, depending on the number of risers. Okay. And here is a picture of a of a fire hose cabinet. Usually, the fire hose cabinet uh, have uh, this length of hose that can reach the farthest point or the midpoint of a, of a long uh, of a long floor okay so that uh, the fire hose cabinet ca can or the fire hose nozzle can reach the farthest point uh, from the from the location of the fire hose cabinet okay Here are pictures of uh, different type of uh, sprinklers. Uh, have uh, the side throws, horizontal throw, and so on and so forth. No? Uh, the specific is that the operating, the minimum operating pressure of these sprinklers are the minimum is seven psi. So. Uh, even is, if a system is designed for very high pressure, like maybe 150 psi, these sprinklers can operate at a minimum pressure of 7 psi. Of course, the temperature for the simplest one would be 57 uh, degrees centigrade. No? So the moment that the uh, temperature 
in the nozzle reaches 57 degrees uh, then it will it will start to uh, blow water or uh, spray water okay so what what do we need to drain why do we need to drain the sprinkler system the main drain auxiliary drain etc okay so here you would see the drains in here no? okay, you would see the drains here here okay and why should the fire sprinkler system need to be drained repairs when you do repairs you need to drain the piping okay repairs need to be made in numerous instances such as when a fire protection system is not properly maintained and there are signs of corrosion okay so what restoring an activated dry pipe system okay that's another one and then extending an existing system so for example in the malls sometimes there is a need to extend it no? and then uh, uh, there is also this loss change so sometimes you need also okay each fire protection system will need to be drained at some point NFA 13 standards for installation of sprinkler system specify that all system must have the ability to be drained when needed now from uh, the 2016 edition of the NFPA 13 8.16.2.1 general all sprinkler pipe and fitting shall be installed so that the system can be drained so therefore uh, if you have uh, a situation where they cannot be drained then of course you have to provide the uh, uh, spatial drainage okay slide fire sprinkler main drain the main drain is designed to flush water from the system through a series of pipes the pipe the size of the main drain is in a proportion to the size of the riser and is specifically by the national fire protection Association. all piping should be arranged where practical practicable to drain to the main drain bulb okay there so you here you have you can see here the main drain when is the main drain used and why the main drain is the central point of the discharge used to flush the water of the system all piping within the system is required to flow to the main drain if the fire protection system needs repair retrofit or test of the coming flow of water the main drain valve is open to evacuate the system of the water it contains where is the main drain located the main drain is located at the fire sprinkler system riser it is to discharge the water outside and away from the building or to a connection that can handle the flow of the drain given that the entire system needs to be drained the amount of water will vary based on the size of the system. This can range from a just a few gallons for a dry system to several hundred gallons in a wet system. Think about filling this a five gallon bucket. One is not going to help you flush a full a full wet system. If the discharge were allowed single building to another connection like a janitorial sink it might not be able to handle the flow which is usually around 100 gallons per minute okay so it is therefore preferable that all connections discharge outside the building okay if the main drain connection leads out to the building it should have protection from the elements to prevent clogging okay all four fire sprinkler types are required to handle main drain to flush and reset the system for future use. What kind of valve and signage is required for fire sprinkler systems? Main drain, no? The NFA doesn't specify particular type of valve for use in the main drain. However, several types of valves are suitable, including an, an angle valve, a volt valve, 
or a test and drain valve. If this drain valves serve uh, a pressure reducing valve, they must be sized to permit a, a flow of at least the greatest system demand supplied by the pressure reducing valve so that it can be properly tested in accordance with NFPA standards. In accordance with NFPA 13, section 6.6.4, all valves used in testing and draining should be approved by the authority having jurisdiction. While third-party listings are, are available for trim and drain valves, including test and drain valves, those listings aren't required for main drain valves under the NFPA code. Main drains are required to be permanently, permanently marked with weatherproof metal or plastic Identifical, uh, identi uh, identification signs. The signs are hung from the pipe below the water, uh, the valve they are listing. They must be secured with non-corrosive wire or chain to prevent them from falling off. There, there also must be a means to indicate that the valve is open or closed. So here is a picture of the, ma of the main drain. Fire sprinkler auxiliary drain. An auxiliary drain is designed to allow drainage when water, uh, when the main drain valve is insufficient and results in water being trapped within the system. The valve size relative to the pipes used is specified by NFPA. Okay, how many drains, how many drains a system contains will depend on how much water can be trapped. Okay. When the auxiliary drain uses or why auxiliary drains are used after a system plus when the main drain leaves the water in the system. Anytime there is a change in the direction of the pipe in the system, there is a danger of water lingering in that area. Where is the auxiliary drain located? Auxiliary drains are located at each point where the pipe changes direction. This drain should be accessible especially those that are in areas subject to freezing. When the pipe changes direction, there is a T connection instead of an elbow. One part of the change in direction flows to the remainder of the system. The other direction flows to the auxiliary, auxiliary drain valve. Okay. What valve size and signage are required for the sprinkler system's auxiliary drain? Okay, so here we have the, the pipe, the, the valve sizes, okay, and here for a wet and for dry. Okay, auxiliary drains are required to have permanently marked waterproof metal or plastic identification signs. So here is the sample of the auxiliary drain. Fire sprinkler test drain. So far, we have looked at the situation draining the entire system. But what if that is uh, not necessary? If your goal is to simply test the fire protection system pressure, then you can use a test drain. Uh, a main test drain connection shall be provided at locations that will permit flow tests of water supplies and connections. Okay, so here is a uh, a schematic showing the test drain. Okay, so here you have a sight glass, inspector's test valve, auxiliary drain valve, and this one is going to the to the sprinkler system. And this is the riser pipe. Okay, and the drain. This is the main drain pipe. Okay. When is the test drain used and why? Test drain is used to monitor, monitor changes in water flow through the system. While it is not essential to basic function of the fire protection system, it is beneficial to have if you have need to run tests. So the size and type of the connections are regulated by the NFPA. The drain test is uh, required annually or any time the water supply is, is cut off will also need to be conducted anytime there is in any maintenance done in the system. Where is the test drain located? The main test uh, drain 
should be placed at a location that will permit the flow test usually as part of the main drain riser. They can also be found at the end of the system. This allows the ability to check the clogs in the pipe. These drains also need to be placed where the valve can be full, can be open full. Most test drains are designed with the wet fire protection system in mind. The drain, the drain function allows the system to be emptied quickly. Okay. So here a schematic showing the 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 drains no? from the supply to the outside. Okay. What type of bulb and side base is required for the sprinklers test drain? The test drain bulb is customary and preferable, but a simple bowl bulb can be used. Okay. Here this is the a picture of a ball bulb that can be used for the test and drain bulb. Fire sprinkler sectional bulbs. We have learned the, uh, the different bulbs, but the sectional bulbs are also provided to, like all control bulbs need supervision. This means they are to be held controlled environment. So uh, sectional bulbs are used to, um, you know, to sectionalize the distribution of the uh, system where there is an interior sectional or flow control valve provided it shall be provided with a drain connection having a minimum size to drain the portion of the system controlled by the sectional valve okay. when is a sectional valve used and why? the sectional valve is used when the need for repair or testing exists for the only specific section of pipe the valve to that section is closed so that test of repair can be performed without having to shut down the entire system. It is also used to test the pressure and leaks within the section, independently from the others. Where is the sectional valve located? The sectional valves are located where each new section begins. If you have uh, multiple floors, or section that are protected then it would be beneficial to begin its branch off area with sectional valve and so on what kind of signage so same uh, must be all provided together with the just like before the signages and fire sprinkler trim valves and signs uh, now that okay so this gauge and uh, check valves being provided uh, remember sprinkler system signs must be permanent and able to withstand the elements and always in view and legible like signs okay that's it so uh, we have finished again uh, that portion now here we have several frequently asked questions Anyway, I'll just run through them uh, so that uh, you can uh, see it. Okay, this is the first question. When inspecting an old system, like a 60 years old system, when, when, when and where does NFPA 25 require a system to be upgraded to present standards? Okay, so here is, here is the answer. So that's how it is. NFA 25 are frequently asked questions okay so we'll get it to, we'll get to that number two question okay then number three question am I required to have a license in order to perform testing and maintenance many US state and local jurisdictions require licenses or certification so that's the standard in America so and since our NFPA uh, our uh, fire code of the Philippines is uh, refers to the NFPA then we must we should also follow this what type of tests okay so uh, here requires testing in accordance with original acceptance test for what that component or subsystem okay then 
is an obstruct obstruction investigation required every five years? Well, there are two activities that are related to obstructions in Chapter 9 that require the attention. The first is an investigation that is actually more of an inspection or described in Section 13.2. So you can uh, read this further. Number six, are bugs, paper, plastic acceptable to protect the sprinklers from accumulation of dust? Bugs are only permitted when sprinklers are, put, are protecting spray coating areas. Plastic bugs must be a minimum of thickness of... Okay, just read it. What is meant by individual sprinkler sample? An individual sprinkler sample refers to each type of sprinkler in a system. For example, if a system contains upright and pendant sprinklers, 1% or not less than 4 of the type of must be removed for testing. Okay. Number 8. If a system has only one riser but serves several tenant spaces, such as a strip mall, should a sprinkler sample be taken from the system as a whole or from each individual tenant. In your case, a sample from each tenant space is not required. The sampling requirements in section 5.3.1.2 is, is intended to be random sampling. sampling okay. And here is number 9. How many sprinklers must be removed from a system for testing? At least requires one percent of the number of sprinklers uh, our local high school is fully sprinkler the sprinklers located in the swimming pool area have turned green are the sprinklers required to be replaced uh, any sprinkler found to be cor corroded must be replaced okay 11 when when replacing sprinklers is it necessary to perform hydrotic hydrostatic test standard for installation when maintenance of repair section intended to address common installation issues such as pipe fitting it is sometimes common practice to hydro test a system without sprinklers installed okay so let's read it do standpipe system require periodic hydraulic test? Yes. I have a standpipe with two risers. The original design indicates a total flow of 750 GPM. Am I required to flow this much water for five year flow test? No. Chapter 5, BNP requires weekly fire pump test to be conducted without flowing water. Does this include circulating relief pump? No. During the weekly inspection of the fire pump in my building, I have observed water near the base plate of the pump. Is this normal or do I have a leak? Small amount of water in the base plate drain is normal. This water should be dripping from the packing glass. During the annual test of fire of our fire pump, it was noted that the that the pump perform performance was slightly less at peak flow than the results obtained during the original acceptance. Is this a problem? This may not be a problem. First, you should verify that all valves on the suction side of the pump and the test header are open fully. Okay, so just uh, continue to read. Then 17, when performing 5-year internal inspection of a flow storage tank, is it necessary to drain the water from the tank or can a qualified diver perform the necessary inspection? In order to perform the required inspection and maintenance activities outlined in Chapter 9, the water is not required to be drained from the tank. A certified commercial drive diver can perform the inspection without draining the water tank. Okay. 18, I I need to perform flow tests through the backflow preventer in my sprinkler system. I have no test connection size to accommodate this much flow. What can I do to comply with this requirement? You have several options. Use fire pump test header if present as a test connection. If the backflow preventer is installed, 
uh, this action side, the null fire pump test will also serve as a flow test for the backflow preventer. The fire department connection may be used as a test connection by reversing the check valve and flowing water out of the FDC. Okay. 19. When is the main drain test required? Main drain test is required annually or anytime the water supply control valve is closed. 20. We have been experiencing pinhole leaks in our sprinkler system. Our maintenance contractor suggests that the problem may be the presence of MIC. What is MIC and how can the problem be corrected? MIC is microbiological influence corrosion. It is the result of certain types of bacteria in the water that attack steel and copper pipe. It can be recognized by presence of orange or black tubercules and so on. Okay, okay so that's it. That's the last page of our PowerPoint. Let us go back to uh, our uh, okay and uh, let's just acknowledge those who were able to send some messages. Uh, Carlex Lumaha, thank you for uh, joining us. And Joseph Palon, maraming salamat po sir, William, sa mga nag natuturo nyo. Welcome, walang anuman. And then Gary Valindez, very informative, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, we were able to log in 2 hours and 10 minutes of this. So uh, since uh, the signal, the Wi-Fi had been intermittent, we will be uploading the recorded portion of this in our YouTube video. Okay, so uh, before we, we end this up, we will have a very uh, uh, a closing prayer. Okay, the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be able to uh, conduct this uh, webinar, although it was uh, bothered by uh, intermittent uh, Wi-Fi signal. Uh, we hope that we're able to uh, still uh, uh, upload this recorded video, and it could be shared by our uh, friends and colleagues in uh, YouTube and in the social media. Lord, we, uh, we ask that you continue to guide us and bless us. Uh, we also ask uh, uh, that you will also uh, keep us away from that, uh, from that COVID and uh, make, up, make our uh, immune system strong so that uh, uh, in the coming days we'll be able to uh, um, come out triumphant to defeat this COVID. We, we, are all ask, uh, we ask this. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you and uh, have a nice day.